so many of us. Hello, and welcome to LSO St. Luke's. Welcome to those of you that are here with us live in London, and welcome anybody who's watching on our live stream. Um, we're going to have a lot of information coming at you quite fast, so I do recommend at this point, if you've got the score, the anthology, or some paper and a pencil, you might just want to get that out of your bag now so that you can make as many notes as possible. So I'll just give you a few seconds to do that. So, my name is Rachel and I'm joined by a wonderful ensemble of players. We've got Will, Sarah, Anna, Dan, Clive and James. And they're going to help us to find our way through Vaughan Williams on Wenlock Edge. So Ralph, or Rafe Vaughan Williams, was born in Gloucestershire in 1872. His family were middle class and well-to-do and very well-connected, and that meant that Vaughan Williams had a wonderful childhood with the best education that money could buy. He went to the Royal College of Music here in London and then Cambridge University, and he had a private income when he graduated, so there was no rush for him to push himself into the world of work. Vaughan Williams took his time. He travelled, he took lessons, he collected English folk songs, and he did a bit of teaching. In 1907, when he was 35, which is quite late for a composer, he went to Paris and to study with the great uh, French composer Maurice Ravel. And this was the first shift in the direction of his music. Ravel was a huge influence and helped to redefine his sound. So from then on, Vaughan Williams' music became a mix of modal harmonies, Tudor sounds, English folk song, and French Impressionism. And once he found this sound, fame followed. On Wenlock Edge is a cycle of six songs written in 1909. They're settings of poems by A. E. Hausman from his hugely popular collection of 63 poems called A Shropshire Lad. Now, these poems are linked by themes of lost innocence, rural life, and the disappointments of youth. We're going to look at just three of Vaughan Williams' settings today, numbers one, three, and five. So the first thing to note is the unusual instrumentation that Vaughan Williams chooses. So at this point in history, the beginning of the 20th century, there had been many, many, many pieces for string quartet. In the 19th century, it became quite a popular thing to write piano quintet, which is a string quartet plus piano. And composers like Brahms and Schumann had written fantastic pieces for that combination. But it was extremely rare to add a voice to this ensemble. And because of that, Vaughan Williams wrote a separate piano part so you can perform these songs without the strings. And later on, he orchestrated the set as well. Song number one is called On Wenlock Edge. The poem tells the story of a blustery gale blowing on Wenlock Edge, which is a limestone cliff edge. So quite a treacherous and scary thing. And we can hear the dangerous weather when we listen to the opening bars. So, what's going on there? There's a lot, so get rid of your pencils. We've got an agitated tremolo figure on the strings, which is doubled by the right hand piano. This features parallel chords in first inversion, and there's a hint of the whole tone scale in bar two. The left-hand piano further complicates things by dividing the beat into sextuplets and triplets. There are some cross rhythms in bar three, though, when the left hand has straight semiquavers against the sextuplets in the right. So you've got cross rhythms. We also have some false relations between the strings. So if you look at bar three, you'll see that there's a D natural in the second violin and a D flat in the cello. That's called a false relation. The harmony here is avoiding a key. So the first beat is an E flat chord, but then unusually we go to A flat minor. And there's that whole tone movement in bar two. Then in bar four, it starts to seem as if we're heading towards G major, or if we're in G major, especially when the voice enters a bit later on. But the harmony here is actually modal, and it is based on a pentatonic scale. The notes of the pentatonic scale are on the screen. G, A, C, D, and F. 
So that's a huge amount of stuff in the first few bars. Vaughan Williams uses all of these ideas to portray the subject matter, which is a scary storm on a cliff edge. And much of this music is similar to what his friend and his teacher Ravel was doing over in France. Now, Ravel was an impressionist composer. Vaughan Williams was not an impressionist composer, but this opening features impressionist ideas. I might just say impressionist one more time, because that's one of those buzzy words that might just come up on your exam. Impressionist. So next at bar six, the voice enters and sings verse one. Let's hear it. also uses the notes of that pentatonic scale that I outlined earlier and it's doubled at first by the left hand piano and the cello. The right hand of the piano has an ostinato, a repeating pattern, that outlines the pentatonic scale and there are short bursts of sound effects that match the stormy topic. So if you look at cello at bar eight you'll see a cello chord and the first violin's upward surge of octaves. That's telling us more about the storm. In bar 11 the melody becomes stuck on one pitch and this gives the words extra emphasis. So underneath the word gale there's a dissonance created from an A flat in the left hand piano and the cello against a G in the right hand. Bar 13 has the highest pitch so far. And this is the climax of the verse, top G. After this, the harmony and the vocal line fall down chromatically. Halfway through bar 16, we have a repeat of the stormy instrumental introduction. And then verse two follows at bar 22. This is a modified repeat of verse one. It's almost exactly the same material. At bar 31, we have some new material. So the piano, turn the page. The piano has rapid hemi, demi, semi, quaver arpeggios. The strings have trills, and this provides a little link to verse 3, which starts at bar 34. Verse 3 is different to what we've heard so far. The text is darker, and so the vocal line reflects this by becoming stuck on repeated pitches or moving around chromatically. The accompaniment is made up from long trills and chromatic slips that are sometimes in unison at the same time as the voice and sometimes answer the voice's phrases. So let's listen to verse 3 in full. <laughs> So there are some examples of word painting here. Word painting is the term for when the musical material reflects the text of the song. Word painting. Have a look at Heaving Hill in bar 37. The words feature, the, sorry, the music underneath features a heaving chromatic line that literally goes up and down like a little hill. Now that is quite an important idea later on. So let's hear it in isolation. That is word painting. That literally is a heaving hill in music. The words hurt him in bar 41 are placed on high, agitated pitches and doubled by the violin. There's also chromatic movement. That's more word painting. Verse 4 is a modified repeat of verse 3. So we've got the trills, the piano rolls and the chromatic slips. It runs from 43 to 55. Look carefully at bar 51 and you'll see that the instrumentation and the texture is reduced down to just piano and cello. And the cello is playing quite high in its range and using the tenor clef. It also features a lot of chromatic movement. So, verses 1 and 2 are the same 
and 3 and 4 are the same. So our structure could be described as A, A, B, B. The final section of this song is the most intriguing and features ideas from verses 1 and 3 combined. So that's the A section and the B section combined. We begin with a repeat of the opening introduction at bar 55, and when the voice enters, it's accompanied by a shimmering sound, which is made up from sol ponticello tremolos on the strings. Now, sol ponticello, as some of you will know, is when the string players place their bow near the bridge, and that makes for a kind of glassy, icy, faraway sound. Let's hear that sound in isolation. That's so lovely, I want to hear it again, please. Isn't that nice? That's sol ponticello, sol ponticello tremolo. And that's a new idea that's coming quite late on in the song. Soon after that, the piano repeats the melody line from verse 1 underneath at bar 62. And that's like a memory of what's gone before, as the words say, "'Twill soon be gone." The chromatic heaving hill idea is repeated towards the end from bar 69 onwards as the music dies away, leaving the piano completely alone at the very end. So the overall structure is going to pop up on the screen. There it is. And whilst it's there, let's listen to the whole song.
let's move on to song number three, Is My Team Plowing? The text of this one is a conversation between two characters, the ghost of a dead man and a living man. Just point out that it's Halloween tomorrow and we're in a disused church. Just point that out there. So we've got the ghost of a dead man and a living man. And these characters alternate. Vaughan Williams gives each one a, type, a different type of music to keep the story clear. This song is strophic, which means that it has verses that repeat. You can think of it in several different ways. You can think that there are three verses and each verse features the ghost and the man, or you can think of it as six verses that goes ghost, man, ghost, man, ghost, man. Either way is correct. So we begin with a four bar instrumental introduction which features all of the string instruments playing completely in unison, so it is homorhythmic. Let's hear the introduction. two chords alternating. We've had a D minor chord followed by a G major chord. Now this tells us that again Vaughan Williams is using modal harmony rather than writing within a key. We're in the Dorian mode which is all the white notes of the piano between D and D or you can think of it as a major scale with the third and the seventh degrees flattened. In addition to this, Vaughan Williams creates a spooky sound world by asking the strings to use their mutes. This makes for a distant, faraway sound. Now, in the piano version of this, when we don't have the strings and just the piano is playing, Vaughan Williams asks for the pianist to use the left pedal, unicorda, which shifts the notes of the keyboard to one side so they only hit a third of the strings that they normally hit, so you get a similar faraway sound. It's also marked mysterioso at this point. When the voice enters singing the role of the ghost, the melody is marked PP Quasi de Lontano, which means very softly, as if from a distance. And it has the quality of recitative. Recitative is a word borrowed from the world of opera. It means narration. And often recitative is sung with a free rhythm and a sparse accompaniment, often just chords underneath. We're still in the Dorian mode when the voice enters, and the texture is then homophonic. So let's hear the ghostly melody. Is my team plowing that I was used to drive? And hear the harness jingle when I was mad. During that short extract, we changed time from 4-4 to 3-4 and back again. Everything changes at bar 9 when the character of the living man enters. is marked animando and poco animato which both mean animated and that's reflected in the piano's blocked chords. We've reduced the texture again just piano and cello and the cello has a counter melody which again is quite high in its range. For some reason this character, the character of the living man, is agitated and we can see this if we look at the melody line in isolation because it features an angular shape and some rather large leaps up and down. The music of the ghost and the man then repeats in bars 19 to 37 and there are some slight changes to accommodate the new text but it's pretty much the same musical material. The text here talks of the ghost's girlfriend and the living man is reassuring to the ghost but he's still very agitated. 
At bar 38, we hear from the ghost again, and now he's agitated as well. And we can hear this straight away because the melody has moved up in pitch and dynamic. It's now forte. The accompaniment features agitated tremolos. The music continues to grow in volume and tension when the ghost asks how the man is. When the man replies, he's even more agitated. He's right at the top of the range, top of the vocal uh, range, on A flat, and it's marked molto agitato, much agitation. The music peaks at bar 50 on top A, fortissimo, and the words, dead man's sweetheart. The last phrase, never ask me whose, is totally solo, unaccompanied voice. And that's because Vaughan Williams really wants you to hear that line. The character of the man is saying that he lies with a dead man's girlfriend. So he's going out with or he sleeps with the girlfriend of a dead man. But he stops just short of saying that it's the girlfriend of the ghost that he's talking to. It's Halloween tomorrow, by the way. Um, the song ends with the instruments playing alone and their phrase is agitated and loud and it gradually dies back to the homorhythmic music of the opening, which then also dies away. Now, this is a really simple but really clever song. Vaughan Williams creates music to portray two contrasting characters sung by one performer. And he uses simple devices like mutes, tremolo and volume to distinguish between these two characters. The ghost music is distant and empty, although it's played by all of the strings, and the man's music has got a much thicker texture with pounding chords, although it's played by less instruments. So, here's the full song.
final song is number five, Breeden Hill. And this one features seven verses of poetry, and Vaughan Williams sets the verses in four different ways. The text is about bells calling people to church and the singer dreaming of marrying his love. But things take a tragic turn when the lover dies, and the bells reflect this. Vaughan Williams uses the idea of bells as a central feature in his song. So the song starts with a long introduction from the instruments and the first representation of bells. The piano there had mostly long minor seventh chords in root position. The strings had the same chords split between them, so the individual players were playing double-stopped octaves or fifths. All of the instruments are playing as softly as possible with the strings using their mutes again. When the voice enters at 24, Vaughan Williams asks for the melody to be sung freely. And so there's a recitative-like feel to the music again as the words narrate the story. The texture here is clearly my favourite, melody dominated homophony. Comes up every year. Melody dominated homophony, which is melody and chords. The melody hint is in G major until bar 29, when top F natural tells us that we're actually in the mode made up from all of the white notes between G and G. And the word for that mode is mixolydian. The mixolydian mode has got this distinctive flattened seventh sound to it. That's where the F natural is. Up until this point, in all three songs that we've heard so far today, Vaughan Williams has set most of all of his words syllabically. So that means one note for every syllable. At bar 29 in this song, we have melisma. That's when you take one syllable and you stretch it over several pitches. This happens at 33 again, and the word that's stretched out is happy. Now, this song is not happy. So the setting of this word and the flat chords underneath it are a hint of tragedy ahead. Let's listen to the first verse. In summer time on Breeden, the bells they sound so clear, round both the shires they ring in far and near a noise to hear. After a short linking passage at bar 35 featuring more bell sounds, music of verse 1 repeats with new words. So the structure so far is A A. Verse 2 runs until bar 51 with four more bars of, link, of bells to link to the next bit at the end. Music changes for verse 3. The text talks of bells calling out to people from miles around, and so the music matches this. The right hand of the piano has a triplet ostinato figure made up from stacked fourths and fifths, and the left hand has long-held chords. The seventh chords from before have extended to become eleventh chords, and we've got a clear three-part texture. So we've got the left hand of the piano with long chords, the right hand of the piano, an ostinato, and the voice on top. So let's hear some of verse three.
has similar music to verse 3, but it's quieter. Notice that during both of these verses, the strings are silent. Verses 3 and 4 run into each other without a break or a link. And at the end of verse 4, at around bar 78, the right-hand piano ostinato starts to fragment away. The text of verse 5 is all about the lover's death, and so the music becomes very quiet and still to match this turn of events. There's a short instrumental link at 84, which features more bell sounds, and a dissonance is created between A flats in the left-hand piano and Gs elsewhere. Now, this is telling us that bad news is ahead. The high strings at this point sound rather icy, and that reflects the words snows at Christmas in the text. So here's that little link. He's really making a feature out of a dissonance there. That's what makes it so magical and amazing. Verse 5 is different to all the other verses. So the structure so far is on the screen. It's A, A, B, B, C. There's a lot of information on that screen, so I'll just have a little look at it. Uh, verse 6 is different again. So we have A, A, B, B, C, D. Vaughan Williams uses a combination of pizzicato and arco at the same time for his bell sound in this verse. Now this is a really clever idea because the pizzicato sounds like the hit of the bell and the arco sounds like the bell ringing on. So here's one of those pizzicato arco bells in isolation. And that's often masked because at the same time you'll have a piano bell going at the same time. But I just think that's really interesting and clever, the kind of idea of pizzicato and arco at the same time. I just think that's really interesting, pizzicato and arco at the same time. You might want to write that one down. So there's more dissonance within the piano part with Ds sounding against E flats and many of the vocal phrases and the piano right hand outline the interval of a minor third. We're left with solo piano at the end of this verse, bar 111, and another instrumental link leads us to the final verse. Now we're going to hear this link and we're going to go on into the final verse just a little bit. See if you can spot where this comes from. They sound on and still the sleepers So hopefully you should have recognised that melody. Anybody recognise that melody? Just give me a little nod. Or just pretend. Recognise that melody. Because that melody is similar to the melody at the very beginning of this song. It's as though, well it is, that Vaughan Williams is ending his song with the melody from the beginning. The accompaniment is much changed though. The strings now have long open harmonics. Now these are delicate ghostly notes, they're kind of like false notes, made by lightly touching the string at its halfway point. The pitch is an octave higher than the one that's written. The pitch is an octave higher than the one that's written. The piano here has rolling arpeggios to create a kind of lush sound underneath. At bar one, two, three, the music grows more agitated and there's a climax at bar one, two, nine when the singer pleads on top A for the bells to be silent. The words there are, oh noisy bells, be dumb. Vaughan Williams asks the singer to sing in a free rhythm at this point and not try too hard to fit with the accompaniment underneath. This climax quickly subsides and the song ends with an instrumental postlude that returns to the bell sounds from the very opening. At the very end of the song, the voice is all alone. So the word for that is monophonic. That's when you hear one sound, monophonic, on the last three words of the poem. So the full structure for this one is rather complicated. There it is on the screen, A, A, B, B, C, D, A, when the opening melody comes back and a postlude on the end. 
We're going to finish this part of our afternoon by hearing this song in full. When the snows at Christmas on breed and papa strown, my love rose up so high and stole out on me. Oh, 
We are going to take a short 10 minute comfort break now. For those of you watching us online, that's the end of our stream. Thank you very much. Look out for future events. Those of you here at St. Luke's, please stretch your legs, have a wander outside, but please just 10 minutes back at two for more. Thank you very much.